All right. Good evening, everybody. I, uh, I really appreciate everyone here taking the time. I know it's Thursday, and the importance of today, of course, is it's the last day of school. And actually, we say it's the last day of school. What a bizarre last day of school this actually is. Um, I really want to thank everybody. We, we put that Padlet out last week because we know everybody in the community has so many questions about what's going to happen next year. And what I can tell you this point, we'll, we'll go through and answer a lot of those questions. I brought in a whole bunch of guests, people you uh, may not necessarily know, but who are critically important to our school district. So I thought it'd be good to get them in front of, um, in front of all of you so you could meet them, get to know them. And they're going to be asking me some of the questions that we've kind of compiled them uh, and put them into categories. So we'll get to those questions. But I just want to go over it over you. One, Padlet, great responses. Thank you. We had like 48 responses on the Padlet. Um, so thank you for using that. I hope that was a good mechanism for those of you who used it, being able to post your questions. And it also gave the opportunity to see the other concerns other people had, uh, which I think is often helpful because um, you, you realize you're not alone with, with these questions. And I, I, I will tell you that with the questions that are posted, I'm not alone with some of the questions you have as well. And you'll, you'll get that as we go through um, this evening. And, and if you're looking for a timetable on this, we, we, we're going to hope to have this done around within, the, within an hour, um, but I think there's a lot of important information here, a lot of information we don't know, and I'll, I'll tell you that we don't know it when we get to that. Um, but let's go, just go ahead and get started. I mean, the first and fundamental question is, it was the last day of school. Isn't it too early to be talking about this? Um, and, and for that, I'm just going to say, yeah, I, I, I would normally agree with you, but I think when you're bombarded in the media every single day, with all sorts of information, and then you hear some of it's not true, some of it is true, it's good to know what's actually factual and what's happening. Uh, and the reality is that there's so much information that gets put out there that gets people incredibly stressed. And we'll talk about that in just a second about the impact, like one of my big concerns, the impact it has on your children and the impact it has on you, uh, the information, especially when it's bad information that gets out there or it's just also the fear of the unknown. We, we're going into a, an area that we don't know. And I, I say this to our faculty and staff all the time. We always have to remember, we're in a pandemic. We are in a state of emergency. In our lifetime, we've not seen this. So it's easy for us to fall back into what's normal, what's traditional in regards to school, in regards to our daily lives. But that's not the world we're in right now. And a lot of us are trying to will it to be that way because we get tired and we just we feel like we have to have that normalcy, so we go and do it. But I'm just, again, just always remember what, what is the situation we're in? Um, and, and certainly we've seen since February, since March 13th that it's been a completely different situation. So what do we know right now? So what we know for certain is this week, and I'm assuming this is going to be tomorrow because we got nothing today, um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is going to be coming out with its initial guidelines for the fall. And we'll hear about this in the questions later on. All over the news, there was this information about uh, only 10 to 12 kids in a classroom. That was never to do with the opening of schools in the fall. That was for schools that are running summer programs if they were going to open. And, and not only that, there's that state requirement. There's also federal CDC guidelines that have to be followed, which make it even more str stringent. Um, so what we know now is that tomorrow at some point, it typically comes late at night, there's going to be information that comes out from the Desi and the commissioner uh, about an initial draft of what things are going to look like in the, in the fall. It's an initial draft. The next draft is going to come out the middle of July. I'm frustrated with that and you're frustrated with that, but it's not, it, it's reasonable to be frustrated, but understand they're having to wait to get the medical information to find out what we're learning about the virus before they make final decisions. So our timeline and this is the great question. Is there a timeline? Yeah, our timeline is we're going to get that final draft. We're going to take days to look at that. And then we're going to start thinking about what can we do within, within those guidelines. Those guidelines are supposed to be about 85 to 90% prescribed. So what's happening in each town should be the same. There's exceptions that will be made. You can submit a waiver, and you can submit that waiver based on in your specific community things are better or things are worse. So you might go one way or the other. Um, but by the middle of July is when we'll have those final guidelines. So initial guidelines, sometime tomorrow, the state is sending those to us. 
the middle of July, sometime in the middle of July, the state will finalize those. Uh, we're going to try to turn those around quickly, present them at the school committee meeting at the end of July. And what our goal is, is to have them out to the community, everybody, by the end of July, because preparing for using the month of August to prepare mentally, uh, prepare your children, prepare yourselves, prepare the faculty and staff for what's going to take place is really important. And we, we want to make sure that time exists. And I'm, again, I'm going to tell you, if I could go like this and have make up everything I wanted to do, I, I would do it. And I would be 90% wrong uh, because things changing nonstop. So when they come out with those guidelines, that will be the basis for the decisions we're making. Everything else that's been sent out before uh, that people were getting fired up about, the news was reporting about, was completely misinterpreted. The only valuable information we did get are the information about the PPE that's expected for the fall. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And, and I said to mention this earlier, it's really important when we have these conversations about education to just reflect on what's happened and what is happening. Uh, those of us who've gone through school, or all of us who've gone through school our entire lives, our entire careers, we have this image, oh, it's in the morning, we get on the bus, we go to school, school ends, we might do clubs, activities, extra help, athletics, whatever it may be, or I might come home, I have dinner, I do my homework. Those days are gone. They've been gone since we ended Mar Friday, March 13th, and we started a completely new era. So what that's going to look like is going to be different. The expectation that that is going to return, I don't think it's a realistic expectation. Uh, we don't know for sure. Um, but I, I would expect that we're not going to see everyone back in school like nothing's happened come the beginning of the school year. Uh, just, I think that's a pretty solid guess. Um, so another important, what are the budget implications? This was actually not something that came up in a pilot. This is my question. I'm answering my own question. They're huge. You all know this. Uh, the, the state budget comes out. The governor gives his budget in the third, the fourth, by the fourth Thursday in January. We are six billion dollars less in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts than when he gave that, and that's at this point it was actually two weeks ago. It might be less than that. That might be might be more than six billion now. So we know for certain there are going to be drastic changes that are going to have to take place. Where the state decides to make those, we don't know. They're not sure. I mean, they're trying to wrap their heads around. It's not like there's one person hiding somewhere who has these answers. They're not. They're trying to figure it out and make sure they get their, have their numbers correct. So we just need to be patient on that. July 1st is when the House is supposed to have its budget, and that's when we're going to make our moves. Uh, you heard about the uh, an article in the paper that we non, did non-renewals for 18 uh, staff members. That was the anticipation that we're expecting the 10% loss from state revenue. And 10%, we think we can do it the way we did it, and that will work. Um, there's districts that are paying for 25%, and I'm just going to tell you 25% to our district means a cutting of 50 positions. And it's important for me to distinguish here renewal versus position. A non-renewal, if you if someone was non-renewed, so if, if the superintendent, Justin Barthelion, was non-renewed, he occupies this position of superintendent. If I was non-renewed, I'm no longer there. But the position of superintendent is still, it's still there. So it still exists. It's going to get filled by someone. So those non-renewals happened. They took place. There was a legal reason for that by mass general law in anticipation of the 10%. But those positions are still there. So this, there's some, we'll get to a special education question, but there is some nonsense going out on social media about uh, the school is not going to be able to meet expectations because special education teachers, some were non-renewed, that we are legally required to. That's absurd to think we can't, we're not going to be fulfilling. We have to. Uh, school can't willingly ignore that. So I'm saddened that someone would go and perpetuate uh, that out there because all it does, again, is speculatively put out information that's based on fake news. I hate to use that term. It's based on false information. And then people in turn go and they get upset and they get anxiety over this. And it's, it's too bad. It's too bad that people use those platforms to do that. But that is the case. That is what happens. And I'm going to just, before we start introducing our guests, just remember the children. And, and we say this with our staff all the time. Children first. That is my number one pillar. Uh, yes, the adults are important. We can't run school without adults and children. No question. But we have to remember the children. I need you to consider and think about 
what our children are experiencing. They're experiencing traumatic events for the first time in their lives. And it's serious. It's something you've not experienced, but you've had traumatic events. For the children, this is completely different. And not only is it different for them from the educational standpoint, it's different from them interacting with their social standpoint, where they don't get to see their friends as much. And again, I know some of you have been bringing people together, maintaining social distance, but that, that has, it takes its toll. And I also want you to consider that your children are able to hop online and they're able to see things and hear things that you and I never did growing up. And that will get them really concerned and really worried. So please remember the children, take care of them, make sure you're aware of what's going on, what they're watching, have those open conversations with them about what's going on in the world. Uh, and, and, and that, that, that will be helpful. I mean, just having that open, open dialogue with them is absolutely essential. So with that, I'm going to introduce my first guest of the evening. We have coming to us from the Sweet Sir and Donahue School over in Merrimack, Ms. Stephanie Denbro. Ms. Denbro, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Uh, thank you for joining me. I really do appreciate it. And and I, I, I'm pairing you up. We've got joining her. Uh, from the high school assistant, so Ms. Dembro is assistant principal over at Sweetser and Donahue, and she's being joined by assistant principal Frank Kowalski, who's assistant principal at the high school. So, Mr. Kowalski, I see you're at a baseball game. Yeah, is that you're at a baseball, baseball field? Best place to be tonight. Yeah, I, hey, it's it was definitely a hot day. Yeah, absolutely. Nope. <laughs> so I understand. No, so, so you guys have have had. You went through, you got some questions. So what do you got for me? Who's firing away at the first question? Doc, I, I have a, I'm going to start this thing on show off. I have a question on remote learning. Sure. We finished up today. It was very oh, here we frustrating. What, what, what's going to happen next year with remote learning? And, and if things stay the same, will remote learning be the same? Okay. So I, I think that let me. Okay, I think I've captured right here. Remote learning, will that be happening next year? If so, will it be the same? So uh, the answer to that question is, yeah, I, I don't know if we'll be doing remote learning next year. But what I say, pretty much it is 100% certain that the biggest change, if there is remote learning, there's going to be multiple changes, but the biggest change would be this whole business of not grading. We know that's not a, like some students who are really strong. They struggle because the incentive is not there and they're not sure what to do. So that grading will definitely be a part of any remote learning that might take place. Uh, but also, we had student feedback, we get the parent feedback, and soon we'll get feedback from the staff on their remote learning experiences. And if there is remote learning, that's a big if. If there is remote learning, then we're going to take all that feedback and there's going to be a curriculum team that's going to look at that, adapt it, so we get uh, do a better job with it. Remember, and I would just remind everyone watching. Everyone was teaching face-to-face -face on Friday the 13th. Come Monday the 16th, we weren't. We were trying something we had never done before. Uh, so as time progressed, things got a little bit better. Um, but still, you know, we have all this feedback now. and that's where I'm going. So good question. And again, I don't know if it's going to be happening next year. Um, my guess is it will not be all remote learning. Like it will happen, I guess. And it's, but it's so you can see two things. I don't think it's going to be all remote learning, and I don't think it's going to be uh, all face to face. I think you might have some face to face, some some blend, some hybrid of some sort. But again, I think tomorrow we'll have that first deal. Ms. Denver, what do you got for him? Or is it Ms. Our, who's up next? I have the next question. And okay. so if we are remote learning next year, okay. how will the district ensure that students with special education services? are getting the, the services um, delivered sufficiently. Yeah, so I think I can't capture that right here. So how the district ensures the student special ed sufficiently? Well, I, so let's just be clear on this. Um, special education has taken a huge, there's no question about it. Uh, students who have the most need are probably having some of the biggest challenges right now. And even in the model, so that model that did come out that had to do with summer school, the three to 12, the distances between, uh, those models were purposely designed uh, to make sure there was that social distance, but also to make sure that you had the highest need students was there on a one-to-one. -one. 
but you need to make sure both the student and the and the teacher are safe in that environment. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, something the entire state's struggling with right now. But they know. I, they, there's every conversation I've been in, uh, the commissioner, they, they know that our high needs special education students are, are the ones who are, are just struggling the absolute most. And there's other students that are as well. But uh, the, these students, trying to get them back and get them back as frequently as possible is going to be critical. Um, so the special education, and, and people wouldn't know this, but we have weekly meetings. And I know Dr. Jarvis with uh, Director of Student Services, uh, and weekly meetings with Department of Ed's special education department uh, on all the things that are changing. And you know, every week there's a lot of the same information, but there are adjustments that do come in. And, and with those adjustments, we get more information about what we're going to be able to do. Um, so I, I, while you mentioned special education, you know I'm gonna go on to that whole thing. That whole idea that we're not gonna, uh, that we had, there was special education teachers who might have been non-renewed, yes, that happened. But those positions are still there. Those are going to be filled. Uh, so we know we'll have people, because again, that's a special ed we're required to. Uh, we know we'll have the people. It's just a question of how are we going to deliver those services safely in a way that both the student and the folks delivering them are going to be um, you know, they'll, they'll be able to make. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I, awesome. I guess you guys are doing back and forth. What do you got? Doc. I'm an optimist, and my question is, we will be back to school in the fall. What will school look like in the fall in terms of, you I, You talked a little bit about this earlier, about class sizes, yeah, yeah. spacing, one-way hallways, cafeteria. Like, what are the students looking at in the fall? Yeah, so we actually, let me go ahead. Okay, so what will we look in the fall, class sizes, things like that. So we actually, I heard from, it was uh, one of the state representatives and, and we have a lot of communication. I, I have a lot of meetings talking to state legislators, including in the Senate Ways and Means, the House Ways and Means, because those are the people who know the most about the budget. But there was um, one of the state reps was talking about in Beverly, there's a YMCA and they have children of uh, nurses and EMS workers for, because they have to work, but they have really children that are going to this YMCA and, and there's been no cases amongst the children of COVID. And a lot of it, you know, they talk about exactly what you said, the one-way hallways, make sure that some of these kids are young. And so we know young kids don't, have to, they have to be next to each other. And if you've ever been in a preschool or not preschool, or, or kindergarten for that matter, you know there's hands-on activities and all that stuff that's happening. Um, so in terms of what it will look like, I think we don't know. Um, I, I can only speculate. Class sizes, I, 10 to 12, like that whole thing about six feet between desks and things like that. Um, that again, that was for the opening, schools were gonna be opening classes in the summer. That's not us, uh, but I know that was taken and interpreted interpreted that way. So my, my I suspect, yes, if the virus, and that's all we the virus, if the virus continues to be prevalent, I think we can expect minimal movement or staggered movement, so people in the hallways are cut down to a minimum. Class sizes, I think we can reasonably expect that there's going to have to be a different way we set up rooms. Um, and and you know, if that's moving a couple desks here and there, that might be. But I also think as the data comes in from the virus, you might see things that uh, an elementary kid, maybe it doesn't transmit as, as easily amongst the uh, elementary kids. Maybe it's just among people who are in their 20s and 30s and older that, that it transmits more easily uh, between. So uh, I think that's information the state's looking into to get back to us. Um, for class sizes, yeah, you better believe. If, if, we, if we're given a restriction that says maximum 10 kids, okay, we know we can't add people. So that means we're gonna be going some kind of a hybrid uh, if we had a maximum 10 and, and you know, it, we'll have to balance out things as best we can. Um, we also know that's a challenge because if you're an elementary parent of a first grader, kindergarten, second grader, or younger, if your child's home, you can't go to work. Um, so I think that's one of the things we're going to have to face. It's a big challenge. We're going to have to face it. How can we make that happen? So good question. And I think when we get more information, you'll hear more from me about that. Ms. Denver, what do you got? Thank you're you. up. You're All up. right. So if we do go back in the fall, will the before and after school program um, start up? 
And if so, will there be a limit to the number of students who can participate? Yeah, I, so I think this is a really important question because we have so many parents who work. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to get into work early, after, and they come back late, or one or the other. So yeah, I think if, if school's back in session, if we are running school, I would anticipate that before and after school is also in session. Um, and, and, and the numbers are something, again, that we're going to have to wait to see what we're allowed to have. Right now, like in, in uh, the central services building, we're allowed to have 25% of capacity. Um, and I think in some restaurants, is it 50% of capacity? I, I, I'm speaking to that I'm not. 20, 25. Uh, 20, still 20, okay, it's 25% all around. So in some of the buildings, when you're looking at the cafeteria and the gym, I, we might, maybe we're not using those spaces. Those are big. So if I look at Sweetser, so yeah. here, that's, that, that holds, I think that's, rated for like 600 some odd children that means you could have 150 we could definitely run uh, uh, before and after school just in there but mm -hmm. just because of the children the way they are and the number of uh, people i mean supervising we probably will occupy a lot of rooms uh, and of course i'm sure we'll get into a question i know someone's going to ask a question about planes so we'll get to that question later so that's definitely one. all right i think you guys have one more yeah doc i'm gonna take this last one um you know, I work at the high school and uh, completely different age group. What about, will there be different approaches uh, for social distancing for the younger grades? You talked a little bit early about this, but can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah. All right. So is it going to be, is going to be a difference? Okay. Uh, so will there be a different, uh, will there be an approach based on their age? How will we make sure social distancing is appropriate uh, and, and especially and I, I know I mentioned it, like the hands-on activities that you do with younger children, early elementary, that's essential. So, yeah, I, I think there's uh, some research that's starting to come out about that. Um, the concern always that I have instinctively is younger children, they may not exhibit the symptoms that they might carry. And when they go home, if they go into a grandparent or someone who uh, might be compromised, they're the immune system might be compromised. That's a concern. But I think if the research is showing uh, or it comes out of the data security, that look, you have younger kids and they're not transmitting as much as older kids, I think we see a lot more um, closer interactions with the younger children. And the older children, if it's different, then that might be different for them. Uh, yeah. You know, when we, when we do look at a situation, if it's the opposite, and I don't think, from what I'm hearing, it's not, it's, it's good, but if it were the opposite, Real problem. Like now you're asking five-year-olds to stay six feet apart all the time. I think I, there's an image. I wish I could pull it up right here. I, I should have thought of this. There's an image of kids out at recess with a six-foot uh, diameter circle around them so that they don't ever go outside. Uh, it, it, that's not. Like, I just I don't see that being an effective way. Or if it is what we're required to do, either back in school and we're just going to be really creative about how we engage the children, make it exciting for them to play and come up with new ways to um, get them engaged. I will say, if that is the route, we would definitely, and I hate to do this to parents, we're definitely going to encourage a lot of hands-on activities at home for stuff that they do uh, so we can get some of the, like, the writing and all those things that they might do at home. They'll take care of all of that at school and maybe do some more hands-on stuff. Because that, the hand-eye coordination, you know, is hard. So, hey, Mr. Kowalski, Ms. Demerel, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hang on. Thanks for us. You're very welcome. Stay in the studio. I'll keep you in the studio. And uh, we're going to bring in our next two guests. So you can see from my next two guests, there's a theme here. The people who are really, really important, who you may not know. So if you're in Groveland at Bagnell, you may not have known Ms. Dembro. You will eventually, if you're at, if children at the high school, middle school, you'll know uh, Mr. Kowalski. So our next guest, we have coming from uh, over at Page, we're going to bring in, oops, Ms. Katie Provo. How are you, Ms. Provo? Hi, Dr. B. How are you? Doing all right. Doing all right. And your sidekick tonight is going to be uh, from the high school, uh, assistant principal and athletic director, Mr. Dan Thornton. Coach Thornton, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it looks like you're out inside of a log cabin. Yeah, I'm at the uh, the Summer White House. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Camp David. Yeah. All right. 
So you also have questions. We do. Okay. And I at first I thank you for being here. I know. So I'm going to point out to everybody here, uh, Ms. Provo. She's not embarrassed to be on camera. She might be nervous, but she's not embarrassed. It's because she, like in so many of the schools, was one of the people who was outside in the sun all day today as parades were going through. Um, so Am you, I that red? That, it's not bad. It's good. I forgot the sunblock. Yes. Well, I'm sure you weren't expecting to be out there in 90 degree weather either. That's. It was hot. It was but I appreciate it. I appreciate all of you guys doing that and, and putting that, those together for the kids. That's, that's, that's great for them. All, all right, right so, are you ready? I, I am. Fire away. So, you know, we've heard in the news about layoffs with art, music, gym. Are we, are the students in Pentucket going to have specials in the fall? So you had to go to the layoff thing. And Sorry. Just, yeah, that's okay. No, that's it. Well, everyone's going to be asking this question. So first I'll address layoffs. Again, there's two different things, the non-renewals and then there's the position. So we have not cut any positions. We there's have not. We've heard in the news. Right, right. And you guys know this because I've gone over this with you several times. We have not cut any positions. Uh, we've non renewed teachers in anticipation that we may have to, but, but we don't know what positions those are that might need to be cut. Uh, that's going to take time. We'll find out about that. And uh, like I said, when the house budget comes out, that'll give us the first good, really good indicator of what we're going to do. But you're right. Across the state, there are approaches that are taken because some districts. Like I said, they're preparing for 25%. They're being told that's what they have to do. Uh, they're being told by that by their municipalities. That's not the case here in Tucket, uh, but they are. They're removing entire uh, PE health programs, art programs, and they're saying, okay, we just need one, one to do the curriculum uh, because all they're planning for is the core. And, and in that process, they're going to bring people back. That is not what we're doing. What we're going to do, uh, we're going to, right, right now, yes, specials are in play. We anticipate having specials. Uh, nothing has changed from our schedule of what students signed up for and what they're going to take. Those schedules, when they come out in August, that, that when they come out in August, they'll see what they're going to have on their schedule. And that's that's how we're set up right now. Understanding that we are definitely in a position where we're, we're going to have to pivot. Like we know numbers are going to come out, and hopefully, hopefully, it comes out right around 10%, a little bit more, a little bit less. We don't have to do much else. We still need to do some shifting around to cover those positions that we talked about. Um, but, you know, that keeps everything relatively intact. I think a bigger question is if we do something like, uh, you know, if we're going hybrid or the number of days, the number of hours of school gets cut down, and I don't know that's going to, but if that happens, a whole different conversation. Uh, but I think, yes, the answer to the question is, will we have still, still have special? As if that is what we are planning for, if the state, if the state guidelines shift that on us, if the budget forces that a shift on us, we'll make those adjustments. But yes, students we're expecting still will have specials in the fall. Good question. Who's next? Right, next question, Doctor B. As you mentioned before, we've been out of school since March 13th now, and everyone has been remote learning, and no one has been back into school. So what do we do about all these learning gaps from these kids? Like have people fallen behind? What are we going to do about this? All right. We hear, I mean, and I know parents, this is one of the big questions I know you've asked. And this, these are all questions that they've compiled from the Padlet. Um, so how are we addressing the gaps due to closure and remote learning? And, and typically what we hear is, what are we going to do to help my child catch up now that they've fallen behind? And I, I will respond initially with, they fell behind everybody in the united states was in this situation schools closed all across the country including colleges and universities so at this point every no, nobody is a true uh june, they're at june 18th in their curriculum where they would have been if we were face to face nobody is we're all back uh however and you know, we've already set up uh, there's a couple models that we are setting up and we know that with teachers we're going to be working next year to say okay Look, if you were in fifth grade uh, this year, next year you're going to be in sixth grade. Well, sixth grade curriculum, we're going to have to look at some of the things that might have been missed and focus in on those and incorporate those into the sixth grade curriculum. Uh, so that's the way that's going to play out. I would say that um, there's also 
uh, we're putting together that, a website and that website is going to have on it links to different places parents can go to it will be done by grade level i think we have stuff for subjects out as well not 100 percent i think middle school i think we'll have subjects out as well but those will be resources that parents can go to they can encourage their kids to go to look at them and it's done up kind of by standards so if you felt like your child wasn't struggling a little bit in biology or in fifth grade uh english language arts you can go on there you find out what the standards are, you click on it, and it will take you uh, to some sites to just kind of give them an overview. Uh, one of the struggles and difficulties, I had this question came up in a school committee meeting, it was a good one, it was, okay, well, what about, um, you know, are we going to be able to do some summer school where teachers are available? And no, I mean, two reasons why. One, contracts and the school year ends for teachers today. Uh, and for those people who are like, oh, can we just bring in teachers? Sure. To do that, you need money. And I think right now we all are aware that when the budget comes out, we may not have a whole lot of money. So doing that at this point would be very, very detrimental to anything we might have to provide uh, in the fall. And I'm not going to go down the road of with the money, the amount of money we're having to spend on PPE. Uh, and I do appreciate that the school committee on Tuesday uh, posted uh, or had, had a statement, a resolution. Uh, they called upon the state to fund it fully as opposed to putting it on each district when you know budgets are going to be cut half quickly. But yeah, so there is plans in place. One, you can do that remote thing in the, in the summer. There will be a website and that information will come out to you. But then also when the school year starts, teachers are going to know they're going to have to adapt and catch up uh, whatever was missed. It's, con it's continuous as well. So whatever was missed, they'll work that into their curriculum. That was a good question. Good question. Does that mean, Ms. Provo, that means you're next? I am. So I'm very optimistic that we will be back in school in the fall. Like your optimism. But there may be some families that aren't really comfortable with sending their students to school yeah. and or and they need more certainty around the virus before that. So will there be opportunities for those students to continue with remote learning if we are all back in school full time? So ultimately what I'm hearing you ask is something along the lines of this. And, and I actually had, uh, I had a, a family already wrote me and said, look, right now we're not comfortable sending our child to school. Um, and my response was, I understand. I completely understand that. Like, if you have your own personal convictions about the virus, but also if you have children who are, are compromised, that might have compromised systems, there might be some hesitancy, especially when school opens up and if, the, the, the virus continues to be prevalent, it creates a conundrum for you. So we don't know the answer to this, but my guess is likely, yes, there's going to be some type of opportunity. I know at this, at this point, the state's even investigating, putting together a huge collaborative um, uh, remote learning, a more distance learning, a digital learning opportunities that our teachers might be able to oversee. We don't know if that's going to happen. If it doesn't, We'll try, we'll try to do that just here within the district uh, because we know we'll have several students. And there's also, of course, there is that option always. Uh, a parent could say, yeah, I, I'm not going to be able to do any of this. I'm just going to decide to homeschool my student. If that's what you want to do, you need to contact Mr. Conway. The rules can look up how that works. But it's such a unique situation um, that I think there will be a whole, there will be a hybrid option. And if the state says you can do this hybrid or, or, or not, if you decide not to do this hybrid, then you're going to homeschool. And if that's the directive we give, we'll share that information. Otherwise, yeah, I think we'll put together uh, as, as robust as we possibly can, knowing that you can never, ever replace face-to-face -face instruction with children. It cannot be replaced. There's too much that goes on beyond language, beyond what's on a board, beyond what's on a screen in person um, that cannot be replicated virtually. Thank Good you. Questions. All right, Ms. Brown. Right. Next up. Uh, it's the start. Okay, my bad. You know, again, we've been doing it since March now, which seems like a long time ago, but it's really not. And the students have been learning remotely. They've been getting a little bit frustrated maybe. So what will we do as a district for, you know, the social, um, emotional development of some of these students 
both remotely, if it's remotely again in the fall, or if we're back in the school. Yeah, I think so. I know you guys know this, um, but I'll open up by, I, I'm sure our viewers do not. Uh, throughout this year, uh, we opened up where teachers were, have, we, we did tra tra training and trauma. So being able to identify children who had under, under, who have undergone trauma, what steps there is we have to take, because it's a very real, even before COVID, it was a very real situation. And, and you could say a lot of it's because of virtual, the virtual world. And it may be, it may be because of social media, it may not be. It may just be that they're exposed to so much more. So all, all of our educators had gone through and exposed to some level of that training. But I think the question about social emotional development, I, I opened up with this, right? We need to remember our children. We need to remember what they're being exposed to, what they're having to go through. The, just, the, the, just the trauma from seeing uh, the, the horrific acts that have been happening um, in Minneapolis with George Floyd and, and watching that murder happen over and over. And that's, we never saw that in our lives, never. Right. Uh, and here they are at young ages being able to see this. And they need to talk that through. Um, so, and, and, and that social emotional development, the, the mental health piece is going to be ingrained when we talk about having the two different teams, the uh, safety return team, curriculum return team we'll, we'll put that, that information later i know i picked that out probably about three weeks ago um but that's going to be one of those components about the curriculum and because we know it's gonna it will be so incredibly prevalent and i'd actually be shocked if in the guidelines that's not one of the uh, one of the standards that has to be put in place that there is readily available uh, support for children who clearly have been impacted negatively uh, by this time away from school um, and i think you know, that it's even a topic is a real big endorsement of the work that we do in our school buildings with children on a daily basis, providing them that structure and a very, uh, from this, from eight o'clock in the morning until, or 8.30 until 3.15 or 7.20 until 2.15, we've got you, like, we've got your back. Um, and, and I think we all know, both of you certainly know. Um, well, I agree. When, 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 the, when the kids go home, we just don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what they're going home to all the time, and we hope and hope and pray it's a loving uh, environment. And, and, and more often than not, it is. And then, of course, we have been in the business lineup with other situations where it's not, and those are the ones that break our hearts, and most people don't know about it. But we do everything we can to support, and that's what we keep on. So this question really does go along with what you just talked about. Will there be any opportunities for additional trainings that staff? might be provided with for helping children with anxiety um, during this time? Students that might have difficulty with keeping a mask on or might just be nervous about the virus. <laughs> yeah, so it's funny about the mask thing, right? Because I think there, I there's an email or something going around about the 25 most common things you'll hear from teachers in a first grade class when it comes to the mask. Yeah. <laughs> you can't use that to wipe, you can't pull it and snap someone else's face. No, you're not allowed to use that to wipe up the floor. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, there's no question. And, and we already, on Tuesday, the school committee acted. Uh, we proposed, and, and the, union, the, the, the teachers union was in agreement with this, that we were, were moving a professional development day out of February into uh, the start of August. So instead of two PD days before school begins, we're going to have three because we know these are going to be the big issues that children are going to be facing. And we know everyone's going to have to be trained, right? Everyone's going to have to know in your job, if, if you are in food services, if you're a teacher, if you're an administrator, if you're a receptionist, receptionist, they're the first people that get to the meet and greet. They're going to need to know these things inside and out. Uh, and that's going to take time. And we don't want to rush through and just pile through something, say, up, oh, check, 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 got it done. Uh, we want to make sure we do it and we do it right. Um, and there's going to be some parts that are going to have to talk, education that's going to have to, have to happen with the students. And again, I'd be surprised if the state doesn't come out with some videos and standards like that. Um, right. if they don't, we will. Uh, and uh, I feel like we do, maybe we, we, we're pretty good with videos around here, I think. Yeah, we're pretty good. I've seen both of you and don't stop believing, so I know you're you're good on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Stick to our day jobs. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> Uh, it's not not easy to replicate journey for sure. 
Uh, hey, I hope that was good. Uh, thank you. Again, you guys stay in studio as well. Get a final for the well, but thank you so much for coming in. I, I really thank do. Ms. Provo, thank you. thank you. All right. So uh, a lot of questions there. Obviously, we've gone through the curriculum. We had some pieces there about safety. Um, and, and we're going to have our last two guests come in. Um, and they're going to get to some more of those questions, but some other ones as well. So let's see. Um, we have coming in. All right. From the middle school, we have Ms. Sabrina Simone. How are you, Ms. Simone? I'm good. Thanks. All right. Thank you for coming in. I know you, know, you like so many of us, a parent, and, and you, know, you and I have talked about this before, that you get so worried on camera that like one of your kids is going to come flying in. I right? locked myself in a room, so yeah. <laughs> so and, and 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 parents, all you all parents, they you all get this. Uh, there's so many. There's times I'm talking to everybody, and I have one of my kids banging on the on the door, banging pots and pans, or coming to ask me a question. Um, and that's just one of the struggles we have with remote learning. And the next person we're going to bring in, uh, when we were here on earlier earlier today, we, we're bringing in Mr. Day. The assistant principal of uh, Bag now, and Mr. Day, and Ms. Simone, you can verify this. Last time we were on together, all we heard it sounded like fighting dogs in the back. <laughs> At least ten. At yeah. least, it's, I agree. It sounded like you had a whole pack of dogs. Yeah. Ms. Simone and I had been talking about having a dog trick uh, act here for the end. <laughs> yeah. Well, based on what we heard, I, I, it, it sounds like it could have been possible. Yeah. So, Mr. Day. I really appreciate you being on here as well. Uh, and so, and I, I think you, uh, um, you know, you and Ms. Buteri have, have done something like you guys do burning questions quite a bit. So, if you're a bag now, Karen, you may have seen something like this. Uh, and I, while Ms. Simone's here, I just want to publicly thank her for everything she's done. Uh, when we needed someone to step up, she stepped into that role of interim assistant principal. Uh, and I, personally, I think she was absolutely awesome. Uh, doing that work and it meant a lot to the district that she was able to do that. She was someone that the faculty knew, that the students knew um, and trusted and I think that just went on. So Ms. Marty, thank you so much for that. Oh, thank you for saying that. Thank you. All right. So uh, you've seen or heard the other four, your four peers go ahead and pepper me. So why stop the trends? Have at it. All right, Dr. B. I am going to start first and I'm going to stay on the topic kind of of masks and okay about during the school day, uh, how safe is it for the kids to be wearing the mask all day long? And then if they are wearing it all day long, are there gonna be opportunities for them to have breaks to take the mask off during the school day? So I actually got this, I think in a couple of emails, or it might've been posted somewhere, and I, I, there were links to websites about how dangerous it is for children to be wearing masks all day. Um, you know. I had a had a conversation with other uh, superintendents, and we actually posed this very question to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed and the commissioner. And it was, look, if if we're in a classroom, and we are already far apart, uh, the students are already far apart. Can they just can they take their mask off? Uh, my understanding is that there's some variation of, of requirement that's probably going to come out based on your age. Um, I think. The reality of a preschooler or a kindergartner keeping their mask on, sorry, uh, all three of us have children, right? Mm -hmm. If you put it on your five-year-old or 2 be five-year-old, what are the chances that's going to stay on? <laughs> it's zero. Um, so, but that, that, again, if I'm the teacher of that class, if I'm the, if I'm the aide in that class, or I'm the paraeducator or whoever might be coming in, you know, that could be a concern. So, I, I yeah, I think – there's no question there's going to have to be some time built in for breaks of taking the mask off. I'm an asthmatic, and I'll tell you right now, I think at some point there were conversations about requiring people, anyone, when they went outside to wear a mask. Yeah, when I go outside and I'm running, I don't put me in a mask. I, I don't need to feel like I'm on Mount Kilimanjaro running uh, when I'm just running on the street in Grove of West Newby or Merrimack. Um, so I think, yes, breaks, very realistic, um, very, very likely. And I'm sure there's going to be protocols that are in place regarding that. So good question. Exactly. Uh, and, and at the same time, I will say there's no, 
yes, we know masks are going to be required. We know they will be. Um, unless, barring some sudden, the virus goes away immediately. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Okay. I'll continue with the masks. Um, you know, we all know PPE is so important right now. And while, you know, we all might not have fine masks such as this one, will the district be able to provide masks for students? So I get a follow up on the mask question. So I, I, first, let me just say of all the PPE that exists, masks are certainly one of the big pieces of PPE. And, and Ms. Simone, did you make that or did you, was that a homemade mask? This was made for me because I do love cats. All right. Yeah. So, so there's all sorts of variations of the masks. Uh, we hear all the time about the N95s as a surgical ones. There's the ones like Ms. Simone just had. I have ones that are just cut out of like, a, it's almost like a t-shirt fabric. Uh, and that works just fine. So what this, I mean, if you're a, if you're a parent or if you're a student, uh, you should expect that you're going to be required to bring your own mask. Uh, I think the schools will, well, we're anticipating we're purchasing masks. Right? So we, we know what we need to get. But we'll get masks for situations where exactly what we talked about. If you have a younger child and you know, they're not paying attention or they take it off and they throw it away or they put it, they, they uh, who knows what happens. Any number, if you've been in an elementary school, there's 20,000 things that could happen with the mask that aren't intended to happen. Uh, but it rips, it gets food on it. Um, you know, we'll have backup emergency masks for children. Uh, but the, the children, just like when you show up and you're required um, to have a notebook or a pencil or come with pens or crayons, the mask is going to be one of those lists that's just that, that never for the first time in the history of here's your supply list of things you need to get, it's going to say a mask. Um, so, Yes, we're providing them for emergency situations or immediate replacement needs, uh, but not for, we're not getting masks for every student every single day. That is not going to be the case. Hope that answers that question. So Dr. B, my question, uh, next one, has to do with transportation. Ooh. So how is the district gonna deal with transportation? I know sometimes you see the buses and there's two kids on a seat. Some, sometimes you get three kids in a seat. And now we have social distancing and so forth. How are we going to deal with that with the bus? Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, transportation is one of those things that I, I cannot figure out. Um, one, it's expensive. It's extraordinarily expensive. And we already know from the, how the Senate Ways and Means that we receive money for regional transportation. It's, it's, when you regionalize, it's one of the incentives. But we know that's going to be one area that's going to get cut. If you put, if you do, I forget what the numbers were. If you can only have like six kids on a bus and there's normal, normally 45, yeah, we can't do eight routes. That that cannot happen. We, we couldn't afford to do that even if we wanted to. Um, so how are we going to deal with transportation is a wonderful question. I, I would expect a couple things. First, right now, right now, one of the questions is we have – um, uh, some students who are out of district placement and, and the question is how do we provide transportation for them? Well, my understanding right now, I can't, I can't call up Uber to come pick me up here at the school right now. Like I'm not getting in the car with that because there's no way I can secure my safety nor can I secure the safety of the driver if there's, if either one of us is infected. And there's no way to know if the person's infected. Uh, so that to me is already problem number one. Like how do you guarantee that everyone that's on there is not going to be is not going to be carrying the virus. It may not be contagious. Uh, how do you guarantee? And I guess you could say that about the flu as well. Then there's no way to know. Um, but then how do you know, like in between pickups and drop offs, that everything's being sanitized? So I think that's going to be a big piece that the transportation companies are going to have to say, hey, here's all the things we're guaranteeing and we're promising we're going to do. Um, so as when you're picking up, we'll, this is what we'll do when we drop off. This is the cleanup we'll do in between. Um, how many students can be on a bus? We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, ideally, it would be everybody that we would normally have on a bus would be able to go on a bus. But I, if I'm as a parent, I'm going to just say, uh, there's, 
topic. I would fully expect a survey to come from the district that's going to ask, one, are you able to transport your child to school? Um, and, and if you are, could you please do that? Because if there are going to be these requirements, um, it's going to make things very, very challenging. Um, so, yep. When we know the numbers, we'll be able to pump out exactly what we plan to do. Uh, but again, if, if it's a hybrid and it's a A week, B week type of thing, you don't need as many you don't need as many students on a bus. So maybe that gives the proper space, and maybe that plays into the plan. So I think by the middle of July, we'll know that we'll have a good indication tomorrow of what they're thinking on that. Um, but it, it, even about extracurricular activities, how can you run if there's that whole? How do you run the band over to any competition or to go perform at the elementary schools if they can't be on the bus together like that that's uh, that is a huge huge question huge all right i hope that's so. all I, I know there's a lot maybe a little too much information but i think that's a, a big big question Ms. simone what do you got i'm up um i think we're all optimists on here so i too am hopeful we'll be in the buildings in the fall um but will there be additional cleaning or disinfecting protocols implemented to ensure everyone's safety yeah so uh, there's no doubt no doubt the answer to that question is yes i will say though i think the disinfecting protocols we started doing i think it was back in february or way above and beyond what was required uh, as soon as we realized that this was a trend and a pattern that was coming, um, our custodians put in a lot of extra extra hours and we were fogging rooms. Not when you say fogging, please don't take this as a, got to put a tent over the entire thing and kill all the whatever, rodents or whatever it is they do with them. This is, it's a, uh, um, a it's a salt-based uh, disinfectant that kills flu, coronavirus, all those other things. But it's a spray down and leaves a residue behind. Um, but it's, we were doing that long before. So I don't have any doubt um, that there will be additional protocols that have to happen. And, 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 you know, in the speculation world and on social media, you hear these, well, maybe we should do two days with one group of students, take Wednesday to disinfect the building, and then do the next two days with a second group of students. Oh, okay. I, I guess that that is something that is possible. Um, but there's, I mean, we see it in banks. We see it all over. There's all, protocols that have completely changed. So yes, um, I think there will definitely be uh, protocols that are in place to help spread, to help stop the spread of this virus and other viruses. I, it's just on my mind right now, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to just put this out there. But one of the more recent pieces of information, like we were prepared to buy. All these, all these thermometers and uh, scanners uh, that set off alarms if someone's over a certain temperature. And we've heard recently from the medical community that that may not be a good mechanism to uh, implement because there's so many false positives and false negatives um, that it's not an accurate way to determine who may or may not be contagious. So, um, yeah, I think the, all those protocols will, will be, again, and like I said before, the way we knew school, it's going to be completely different. And, and how long it's going to be completely different for, I'm not sure. But for the time being, yeah, it just, we, you got to think outside of the box on, on what school may be. By the way, Mr. J, I appreciate you wearing your Pentucky P shirt. Thank you. This is the other logo, right? The P, I see you have. Yeah, I've got the, I've got the oh, sorry, other side. I've got the P with the shield. Absolutely. Looking good, looking good. So, uh, I'm gonna ask a question here that I'm sure for a lot of students is on their mind. I know when I was a student, something very important to me was the extracurricular activities after school and the sports involved after school. So uh, I'm wondering about, um, are there going to be sports in the fall? And then to elaborate on something you talked about, if there are sports in the fall, you were talking about running and having to wear a mask. Are yeah. the kids have to wear a mask while playing sports uh, if there are in the fall or these extracurricular activities? Yeah, uh, so ooh, extra for, for athletics and extracurricular, they have to wear masks. Uh, I think we're, you know, actually, I don't have to deal with this this way. We, this is an MIAA question, and I know they're tackling this. They work separate of the schools, and the schools has advisement. But we have with us an athletic director 
who I'm going to add, bring in here, Mr. Dan Thornton, so he can hop in here and kind of give us. Mr. Thornton, how are we doing? You're doing great. So thank you for hanging. I knew this might come, some places might come up. So the question is, will we have sports in the fall, and will athletes be required to wear masks? So if there are, if are we going to see cross country kids running up and down with masks? Well, obviously it is. It's a great question. And um, in terms of will we have sports, we have a full schedule locked in. We're ready to go. So the schedule's ready to go. We have a full schedule for all the sports in the fall. We're just waiting for the, the go from the MIAA, which right now they have a task force that they've put together, which includes superintendents and athletic directors and principals from various high schools in the state. And they're basically just you know, they got their ear to the ground and they're working with state officials as well to try to come up with the uh, safest and best way to have sports continue in the fall. Sure. So, Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, like, like so many things. So what I'm hearing you say is basically we're in a holding pattern. We'd like to. We're in a holding pattern, though, and we'll have to see what happens. I actually uh, I was outside um, last night running around the track. I ran to a truck out of Mopolis, who's uh, one of the he, he's a. Uh, athletic coach over at Central Catholic and he was we, we were talking about the same thing and it's you know by this time they're usually working on a, whatever they're working on and they, they're, they're not able to so correct right um, to summarize what I heard you say MIA has got its task force they're going to try to figure out what they can do and they'll let you know and then you'll let me know and we'll let we'll let everybody know from there that's correct okay now uh, thank you for that I'm gonna, it's not your time so you're you're out I'm sending Bye. you <laughs> <laughs> all right so yeah good question thank you for that Mr. Day um, yeah, I think we got one more from you guys. All right. Yeah, I think this is the last one. So um, it's hard to believe, but today's the last day of school. So as more information comes out over the summer, how will you inform families, Dr. B? So uh, I know I don't know how people feel about this mechanism, but I think this 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 platform, I feel like allows me to give a lot more information. If I use email, I can. You know, you can bullet some things. Sometimes it's open for interpretation. I feel like this gets a little more uh, to the point of what we actually know instead of people trying to interpret. But, uh, yeah, it, it, based on the timeline I said, tomorrow at some point we'll get those guidelines. When we get those guidelines, don't expect that this weekend, while the media is going crazy over this, by the way, and they're going to be putting all this stuff out there, it, resist the temptation to follow it. Give us time to look that over kind of fear where it's going to be and it's just going to be a draft it's not going to be the definitive for the fall the middle of july is when we think we'll have the definitive for the fall from the state and at that point we're going to put together our plan and finalize our plan we'll start working on our plan as soon as we get the initial draft um, we'll read through it next week we'll start talking about what what makes the most sense we'll put together that uh, curriculum team uh, the return team the curriculum return team the safety return teams and let them do their jobs and there will be you know there'll be a lot of people involved in that and let them do their jobs uh, and then when the final guidelines come out in the middle of july we'll fine-tune those plans we'll get them to the school committee and that meeting in july and then once that's been approved by the end of july i will be out all over the place trying to make sure uh on social so i'll post stuff on twitter i'll send the infinite campus We'll probably do something like this because there'll be more questions that parents are going to have. Uh, and hopefully at that point, instead of saying, I don't know to so many of these questions, we'll be able to say, this is the guideline. Here's what we're following. Here's what we're doing here. You know, is, is it possible to keep my child home? Yes, the state said that is an option that they're going to provide. Or no, the, child, the state has said your child has to come to school or you have to homeschool. So transportation, are we gonna, how are we going to do transportation? We'll have those answers. So. Um, yeah, I, I think if nothing else, you'll get a lot of communication from me. And when we start up the school year, we get close to the school year, I will turn that over to the building administrator. So, Ms. Simone, uh, you won't be sorry. Would have been Ms. Simone. <laughs> so, Mr. Day and our other assistant principals who are with us, I, I will depend on you and um, your, your uh, building principals to pump out as much information, accurate information as possible. Um, so yeah, good question, good question. Maybe a video comes out of this too. You never know, a, a fun but serious video of what the changes are gonna be, that, that could be a possibility. All right, so 
Um, I'm gonna just I'm gonna bring everybody in. Um, and I just before I do that, I just want to thank all of you for watching. I know it's been about an hour. That's uh, it's an hour right now. It's I, I hope it was good information. I know it's not all the information. I hope everyone understands that the reason why it's not all the information is because we don't have all the information. Uh, when we get all the information, we'll get that out to you. Uh, but I think I hope this answers a lot of the questions. Like I said, there were well over 40 people who posted questions. These questions looked like they were combinations of a whole bunch of other uh, questions that were in there. If you do have uh, other questions that you need to have answered, uh, run them by your building principal. Um, and and some of those, or a lot of the questions that are posted here on the Padlet, are, we don't know. We don't know until that plan comes out. But I just want to thank you so much. Before August is the guide where I'm giving you now. We need to have something to you. The state needs to have something to us so we can have it to you before August starts because that mental preparation for everyone is going to be so important. And be certain, like the, the, the teams that we're putting together, the curriculum teams and the safety return teams, those two teams, I already have a list of 100 or so questions that they need to go through to check off, say, yes, we've addressed this, we've addressed this, all these different concerns. That's the basis to make sure we've got everything answered going into the school year, even with the guidelines that are gonna be in place. So, uh, and there'll be lots more questions that I'll, we'll be reaching out to the community to get their input and their specific questions on as well. So thank you to the two of you. I'll say goodbye to everybody right now, but I wanna bring in again, let's see, Ms. Dembro, again, so you have Ms. Dembro from Sweetser and Donahue, Ms. Provo from Cage, you have Mr. Day up there in the top right-hand corner, Ms. Simone from the middle school. These all are assist all our administrators here. Uh, Mr. Thornton, who you heard from, and I will bring on Mr. Kowalski to let them say a final goodbye. I'll say my goodbye now. I'll leave. I'll put Mr. Kowalski in. And I just want to thank everybody again for watching. Uh, be well, everybody. And I'll talk to you soon. But first, let me get Mr. Kowalski. Howdy. Howdy. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for everybody for uh, taking this and doing a great job. And a special thanks to Sabrina Simone. It's been great working with you this year. And you're not going anywhere. So we're not going to say goodbye, goodbye. But you did an awesome job this year. And we were all really, really, really enjoyed working with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job. Thank you. Sabrina Thank you. is aces. aces. <laughs> All right, assistant principals on three, we did a great job. <laughs> <laughs>